grade eight English language arts lesson two for the week of June 8th through June 11th. This lesson is presented by Miss Alexis Wally from the Office of Secondary ELA. The theme for this unit is the challenges of living in a divided nation. Our essential question is, how can one individual challenges reflect the struggles of an entire nation? After today's lesson, you will be able to compare and contrast the structure of two or more texts and analyze how the differing structures of the text contributes to its meaning and style. And write informative or explanatory text to examine a topic and convey ideas, concepts, and information through the selection, organization, and analysis of relevant content. Last week, we read a historical fiction text entitled The Drummer Boy of Shiloh. We learned that historical fiction adds a human perspective to the facts, dates, and statistics that often come with the study of the past. These stories allow us to gain insight into key events in our country's history in a way that history textbooks cannot provide. In this lesson, you will return to the story of the drummer boy of Shallow. However, this time you will be reading the story in poetic rather than in a narrative form. Before we read the poem, let's remind ourselves about some of the conventions of poetry by completing a tutorial from collections. Remember to take your notes, especially on those things are words that are in bolded, that are bolded. Just as a story has a narrator, a poem has a speaker, the voice that talks to the reader. It's important to remember that the speaker and the poet, poet are not necessarily the same. Who is the speaker in this example? The teacher's face falls, wrong answer. A slow burn creeps, turning pink and red, falling up my neck, fanning out over my cheeks. I look down and pretend to study the name carved into the desk. Is it the teacher talk, speaking here or a student? If you chose the student, you're correct. The speaker of the poem is a student who has just given the wrong answer in class. The words, I and my, let me know that it's the speaker who blushes and looks down. Form refers to the way a poem is laid out on a page. Unlike prose in which sentences follow one after another in paragraphs, poetry is divided into lines and stanzas. Stanzas are groups of lines. The place where a line ends is called a line break. The end of a line of poetry does not always signal the end of a sentence or a thought. Often poets will continue a sentence or thought across several lines. Let's look at the poem here. It was July and the sun toasted the emerald grass until it smelled of warmth and green life. It was July and my heart soaked up the airy warmth until it sung of joy and love and life. This poem here has two stanzas and in each stanza it has six lines. One thing you will notice about poetry is that it comes in all kinds of different forms. Some poems follow strict rules about lines, stanzas, rhythm, and rhyme. These are called traditional poems. Some traditional types of poetry you might know are ballads, sonnets, and limericks. Other poems have has no recognizable patterns or rules. Their lines do not rhyme in any regular way and it might not even be similar lengths. These poems are called free verse poems. Traditional or conventional poems follow rules for lines, stanzas, rhythm, and rhyme. For example, a sonnet must always have 14 lines and use a particular pattern of rhyme. Ballads and uh, odes or other traditional forms have different rules. In many traditional forms, the rhyme, beat, and structure repeat regularly throughout the poem. For instance, if the first stanza contains five lines, so might the other stanzas. 
Usually, traditional poems have a rhyme scheme or a pattern of rhyme that repeats across the different stanzas. To identify a traditional poem, ask yourself, do the lines, stanzas, rhyme, and beat in the poem follow patterns? While traditional poems follow rules, free verse poems break them. What type of poem are you? A traditional poem or a free verse poem? Free verse poems do not contain regular patterns of rhythm and rhyme. In free verse poems, lines and stanzas may be of varying lifts. The poet lets ideas rather than a set number of lines or stanzas dictate how a free verse poem looks on a page. This type of poetry is often described as sounding like everyday speech. Let's look at this poem in the image to the right. The bell rings with a roar, the doors fly open down the halls. Tao squeaks under a hundred sneakers, the music between classes. Sound devices are techniques used to give poetry a musical quality. Both traditional and free verse poetry often contain sound devices. Rhyme, rhythm, onomatopoeia, alliteration, assonance, and consonants are sound devices. Let's look at rhyme. Rhyme refers to the repetition of sounds at the end of words, as in night and fright. There are several kinds of rhyme. In rhyme, the rhyming of words at the end of lines. Internal rhyme, the rhyming of words within a line. And slant rhythm, a slant rhyme. Words have similar but not identical sounds. When each rhyme has a pattern, it is called a rhyme scheme. I'm going to pause right here for a second so you can take notes on rhythm, alliteration, onomatopoeia, assonance, and consonants. Because poems, as a general rule, have fewer words than short stories or other prose, word choice is an important element of poetry. Poets must choose each word carefully to communicate their intended meaning and effect. Let's look at the two short poems here. Suddenly, she felt the wind rip through her long curling hair. Suddenly, she felt the wind whisper through her long curling hair. Notice the words in bold. See how the bold face words have changed to convey a different feeling. Imagery is a language that helps a reader recreate in his or her own mind what the writer is describing. Poets use imagery in addition to word choice, sound devices, and form to give their poems meaning and to tap into different emotions. Poets create imagery by using sensory details or words and phrases that appeal to any of the five senses, smell, touch, sight, hearing, and taste. Let's look at the example of the poem and see how the poet used imagery. The storm rolls in growling and rumbling on the hills of the night, arriving with a blinding flash. Each flash brings a breathless pause before the sky splitting thunder. I sit at the window, metallic air on my tongue, and await for the rain. In this example, the poet appeals to the senses of sight, hearing, and taste to create a vivid image. For example, he said blinding flash, that is sight, growling and rumbling, that is hearing, metallic air on my tongue, that is taste. One way that poets create vivid imagery is through figurative language, creative comparisons that are not literally true. They are similes, metaphors, personification, and exaggeration. Figurative language can help you picture ordinary things in new ways. I'm going to pause it here for a second so you can take notes on 
types of figurative language, exaggeration or hyperbole, metaphors, similes, and personification. Now that you know a little bit more about the elements of poetry, it's your turn. Today, you will read the poem, Battleground Shallow. As you read, think about how the poet shows that the drummer boy was a valued member of the army. Reread and annotate for examples of structural elements of poetry that were listed in the learn about section. After you read, complete the chart by listing some of the structural elements of the poem from your annotations. Be sure to provide an example from the poem for each element. For your assessment, you will be asked to respond to the following prompt. In this week's lesson, you have examined two texts in order to analyze how the structural elements of each contributes to an overall meaning and style. Now you will write an essay explaining how both authors developed the idea that a drummer boy was a valued member of the army during the Civil War. Use support from your analysis of both texts to develop your ideas. You may use the sample sentence starters below to help you begin. And that is a wrap. Stay safe out there. Have a great one. Hello, it's great to be back. I'm here today to present two lessons, lesson one and two for the week of June 8th through June 12th. This is ELA GT8, and the lessons are called Finally Farewell and Making It Fabulous. My name is Trista Gordon, and I'm happy to be with you today. It's really time to take what you've learned throughout the unit and apply it to your own writing. The student outcome is that you will use rhetorical devices, appeals, and situation to craft a farewell speech or blog post for your fellow students. And I made a note there to remember teachers, administration, friends, and relatives may also be listening. So to consider um, who your audience is for your farewell. I really like this quote and want you to think about it. You, in effect, are the messengers of this era. How can you be one of the messengers of this time and place? How can you use language to affect your community? Take a few moments and think about how you would answer these questions. Keeping in mind our overarching essential question has really been about how language does influence our community. Okay, let's take a look at some possible responses. I'm gonna put them up a few at a time. Be a messenger by exuding a positive attitude. Start conversations. A simple good morning or how are you goes a long way. Compliment others with strong words that have positive connotations. Look for ways to encourage others and support them. And that can be done through words or actions. Asking thoughtful questions that provoke new ideas. Being persistent when you feel strongly about something. And finally, forms of expression aren't always through written language um, or even verbally. Art, music, and the performing arts, and I made note to watch AGT, America's Got Talent last night would be proof of forms of expression for sure. And then of course, your various platforms of social media and always being mindful of how you express yourself. Okay, as you know, it's mid-June. I can't believe it, but it is. And I love this slide because it's a really nice overview to think about your goal for your writing assignment, your farewell speech. And you're looking back and you're looking forward. As you leave eighth grade, you have the opportunity to reinvent yourself in high school and or keep what you love about yourself and amplify it in a new way. What plans do you have? Jot down a few of your hopes and dreams for high school. You may want to include parts of this in your speech or blog post. Okay, so again, 
as you think about your farewell, and we're going to talk through the writing process a little bit today, you're really looking back and you're looking forward. Okay, so it's time to wrap our heads around your writing. You will write a speech or blog to say farewell to middle school. It's important to do this even though we are apart. We do need to celebrate the transition from middle school to high school and say farewell and prepare for the future. You may have many tools at your disposal to help you touch both the hearts and minds of your audience and make your point of view known. We're going to review the tools and put some stars next to the ones that you think would be effective for your own speech or blog post. Okay, and they may not all come to you right away. As you're writing, you may decide to incorporate some of these tools that you've learned along the way. Anaphora, ascendentum, hypophora, parallelism, repetition. These should look familiar. Okay, consider these structural elements to make your writing a little bit stronger. Which ones will you use? A few others for meaning, antithesis, metaphor, rhetorical question. Again, these are terms that you've learned throughout the unit, should be a review, and hopefully now you will be incorporating these examples in your own writing. And one final review of the rhetorical situation an ethos, pathos, and logos. And we'll see these things coming together in your farewell speech. Okay, I don't have enough time to give you for you to actually sit during this particular PowerPoint presentation to write these answers down, but if you want to, grab some paper and just jot down a few of your ideas and then come back to these questions that are in the lesson, I encourage you to do so. Um, before you begin writing, I think it's important that you consider what your central message is about saying goodbye to middle school and preparing for high school. So again, focusing on your message. Can you use any personal anecdotes that support your message? And we looked at examples of these in the speeches that we've looked at in past lessons. How can you use pathos, ethos, and logos to balance your speech? And what devices could strengthen your message? As you know, for writing, organizing your thoughts is critical. Structural organization is also important. And I captured this um, introduction, paragraph, conclusion organizer, not so much to tell you exactly how your writing needs to be structured, but just to give you this brief overview. Okay, so as you see um, in the center here, this is a typical five paragraph essay with three body paragraphs, the main body of the text. Um, I don't want you to feel confined to that organization unless that is something your teacher definitely wants, but I do want you to really think through your introduction, your body, and your conclusion. And when I've taught the farewell speech in the past, my eighth graders really did come up with some great introductions and hooks, and we'll talk about that in a minute and then used um, transitions throughout the body paragraphs to take them through what it was like as a sixth grader coming into middle school. So almost again, thinking back about how they, how they came in and then leading us through how they're going out and looking forward towards the conclusion to the future. So just keeping that overall context in mind. As we continue, we're gonna go through that process. I'm gonna take you through introduction, body ideas, and concluding ideas. And again, that hook, that introduction here, is it needs to engage the audience. What will you use? 
Um, could it be a personal anecdote, okay, or a rhetorical question, or a quotation, or something vivid with sensory details? That's going to be part of your own um, ideas and your choice that represents your style. So last week we read two speeches and we looked at examples in those speeches of the rhetorical devices being used as well as the appeals. And just for the sake of looking at the introduction, I did pull the introduction from Christopher Waddell's speech. And I want you to think about how he started. A couple of years ago, I returned home from a long trip and he goes on to talk about his experience in China. He said um, at the end there, he had um, a collective mailbox at the end of the street. I parked my car, started pulling my wheelchair out. And I just wanted to show that beginning piece there. And if you could consider what technique he's using or he used. Okay, so there's a piece of um, his experience, a personal story, if you will, and that's how he chose to start his commencement speech. Um, his purpose there for this speech a little bit different than a farewell. However, you may decide to think of a personal story that would support your message for a farewell. As you work your way into the body of your speech or blog, it's important to consider how you're gonna develop your ideas using transitions, your style, and of course your reasoning and your rhetorical situation. Um, and up there, looking at supporting details, I think you may want to use a balance of examples and facts and opinions. However, I think the majority of your body paragraphs will probably be based on personal observations and experiences. However, a nice balance is always a good thing. Okay, to look at a piece of um, Waddell's speech again from last week, I wanted to select what I thought was a good body example. Um, and within his speech, he goes on to reference a Holocaust survivor and psychologist. And the quote is that um, success like happiness can't be pursued. It must ensue as the unintended byproduct of one's personal dedication to a cause greater than oneself. So um, what technique did Waddell use here in his speech? So we see a few things. We definitely see that he has quoted um, someone, a Holocaust survivor and psychologist. Okay, and that can be powerful, quoting someone, in this case, who has had a horrifying and emotional experience. And then we're also going to see um, the pathos and ethos represented. As you work your way towards your conclusion, it's important to remember when you get here that you're sure to restate the claim and its significance. Um, you don't want to be overly repetitive in your conclusion. Maybe spark some thinking uh, from your audience and put out a new idea that's related to your message and leaves your listeners or readers something to think about. Okay, let's take a look at an example of a conclusion. I pulled this from Octavia Spencer's speech we read last week. So what's next for you? What path will you choose? While you reflect on that, I will leave you Emerson. Quote, do not go where the path may lead. Go instead where, oh, there is no path, but leave a trail. Think through that conclusion. What did Octavia Spencer do here at the very end? And if you see her ending with a rhetorical question, actually two, and then she followed by a quote from a well-known author. 
how will you end your farewell? So throughout the lesson, um, lesson one was really to take you through the writing process and it kind of leads into what's next, which of, of course is to always look over, edit, get someone else to look at your work and revise, maybe several times. I think you may be inspired by a few famous people who have been quoted over the years during the commencement speeches that they have made. See if you know who this is. Kanye West, who said, when you're the absolute best, you get hated on the most. And he goes on to talk about overcoming that challenge. And Ellen DeGeneres, it was so important for me to lose everything because I found what the most important thing is. The most important thing is to be true to yourself. Oprah Winfrey, I really like what she says about failure here. Go ahead and read that quietly. And Bill Gates. He encourages students to be activists and take on the big inequities. And I think this goes back to what we talked about in our Think About, how you can be a messenger. And at this time, I think that's more important than ever. So as you're writing your farewell, what will be your most inspiring line? Eighth graders, I'm really proud of you. I know that you've been in a very unique situation um, as you're winding down your eighth grade year. I wish you all the best and happy writing and a few final thoughts. 